Welcome back to another episode of Psycho Cinematic. Today we're doing our first ever book movie comparison for The War of the Worlds, written by H.G. Wells, and War of the Worlds, directed by Steven Spielberg. As always, spoilers ahead for both the book and the movie. So I read The War of the Worlds while I was on vacation, which was a hilarious juxtaposition because I'm sitting next to a pool in Mexico while reading People Get Vaporized by Heat Ray, which is just bizarre, but I apparently thrive on the darkness. So the biggest and most obvious difference is the fact that Steven Spielberg dropped the from the War of the Worlds, but I just had to make sure that that got said and someone didn't point out in the comments that I missed that. So something that I had never known about the book was that it was published in 1898, which is just mind boggling because of the sheer amount of creativity and imagination that H.G. Wells had. I mean, I don't really know what it was like back then as far as source material goes for aliens, but a lot of this stuff, it's like, it's really cool that he was able to come up with that and was so descript when there's not a ton of crazy technology around at that point. You know, they've got steam engines, telegraphs, radio, and that's about it. They weren't using phones. I didn't read about them using a single car because cars were recently invented. And so it's mostly horse-drawn carriages and the like. So when you think about that and you combine it with an alien invasion where they have heat rays that are just bursting everything into flames and their tripods that move super quick and they're huge, that's terrifying. I thought Steven Spielberg's depiction was scary, but they actually have technology. And I know that, you know, it basically acted like an EMP in the movie and basically made all cars useless, but at least they had better weapons and whatnot. It's frightening stuff. So something that blew me away immediately about reading the book was that it was confirmed that these aliens are Martians. They never explicitly say that in the movie, though I was noticing that they were kind of hinting that it was Mars with some imagery. In the very beginning, when Morgan Freeman is talking, the earth in the water drop on the leaf in the beginning slowly turns red and then it turns into the stoplight. And then later it shows earth in space and the camera is kind of pushing past a red planet, which, you know, I first was thinking was the sun, but then there's a bright glow from behind Earth that could have been the sun, or maybe that was Mars. I don't know. It felt like they were hinting that it was Martians, though the humans never figured that out like they did in the book. And the way they figured that out in the book is they were actually noticing green flashes up on Mars. They noticed one a day, I believe, for 10 days, correlating with the 10 cylinders that come down and crash land on Earth, which is now another difference because in the movie, the aliens ride down on the lightning to basically get their tripods that have been buried on Earth a while ago. But in the book, they are just crash landing on Earth because they're trying to take it over because Mars is becoming too cold for them to exist on. At least that is the narrator's assumption. Another big difference is the fact that the book is set in England, which I had no idea. And then the movie is set in New Jersey, which I feel like is a tip of the hat to Orson Welles, who made the popular 1938 radio broadcast that set off a lot of panic in America. I had made a video about this on my Instagram. If you're not following me already, you should definitely check it out because I post a lot of different short form movie content on there that doesn't make it onto the podcast. But anyway, Orson Welles, adapted H.G. Wells's, I mean, what's up with all these Wells's, book into a script, or at least he had someone at the radio show adapt it, and they basically made it sound like an alien invasion was actually taking place in New Jersey as the broadcast was happening. And it was the day before Halloween too, which is a dick move. Anyway, I think that's why Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds was set in New Jersey. So when you stop and think about how this book was published in 1898 and how that was before World War I and before World War II, it starts to make things set in a little bit more. The narrator was talking about the utter damage that the tripods were doing to the town, just obliterating everything. And he says in the book, never before in the history of warfare had destruction been so indiscriminate and so universal. You haven't seen the atomic bomb yet. What's interesting though, is that he did live past the invention of the atomic bomb. So I would have loved to hear what H.G. Wells had to say about that. And maybe it even exists out there and I just 
haven't looked it up yet. Also, since this book was published in 1898, it's funny the way H.G. Wells tries to explain some of this technology. When he's explaining the tripod, he literally makes an analogy. He's like, imagine how crazy it would be to see a milking stool up on one leg, trying to describe how they walk with two legs out and then one in the back. And a milking stool is probably the only type of tripod that these people back then would see on a regular. And later in the book, they're also talking about how the Martian machinery, you know, is just so crazy to them. And he was like, imagine a steam engine to that of ants or something like that. And it's just hilarious because that's the only way you could probably get that information across back then. The movie did do a good job at showing the utter destruction that is left from the tripods when they just destroy a city. In the book, they call it a heat ray and it basically just lights everything and everyone on fire. And in the movie, they refer to it as a death ray. And it's super interesting because the death ray from the movie just, you know, ignites the person into powder, just turns them into ash immediately. There's no fire left there and only the clothes remain, which I don't know what kind of technology just like this ray reacts with skin and buildings and whatnot, but not clothing. They should definitely just coat all the buildings with clothing. War the world tack, baby. Something I thought was interesting was in the book, after the Martians are invading, you know, news travels really slowly. So they print a newspaper and they basically print it over the front page with fresh ink of what they think they know or what they do know at that time about the Martians. And there are people who are still working, handing out these newspapers. It's funny because if I was in this position, I'd be like, fuck working, fuck that. No, uh, I'm gone. I'm moving as far away from this area as possible. And what's interesting is it reminds me of COVID because during that time, you know, people kept working and, you know, that's whatever. That's not the part that I'm talking about. It's the fact that there was price gouging. The person selling newspapers, which was charging an exorbitant amount of money, which reminds me of the people who bought up all the hand sanitizer and sold it back to us at highway robbery like rates. Also in this book, I was kind of surprised because, you know, I was waiting to hear whether or not all these pods were going to invade all across Earth. But no, it was really just London. I know they only saw the 10 flashes in 10 days of Mars. But what's interesting is, you know, in the movie, it's happening worldwide, which is much scarier, though the book does end by talking about how they don't know if the Martians are going to regroup or what, but that they do know that the Martians are now on Venus, I guess, based on what they saw in a telescope. So maybe the Martians learned their lesson. Who knows? So I took notes about how the Martians look in the book because I didn't want to forget about that. So they have 16 tentacles and they have a head that is four feet in diameter that is basically their body. They have two eyes and then one ear on the back of their head. Like in the movie, they suck out the blood of their victims and they rode down in their cylinders with a couple of human-like organisms that they were able to feed on that entire time. And they don't have a digestive system. They just have a heart, brain, and veins. So in the movie, when the first pod is about to rise, Tom Cruise's character, Ray, which I think it's funny that his name is Ray, uh, just because of the heat ray or the death ray. I don't know if there's any significance about that. And I also don't know if there's any significance about the fact that he, his son, and his daughter all have names that start with R, Ray, Rachel, Robbie. Anyways, he picks up some of the asphalt and he says it's basically freezing to the touch. And I'm guessing that's them kind of nodding that Mars was too cold for the Martians, but in the book, when they crash land their cylinders, it's so hot that these aliens don't come out for like a day or two. And also in the book, when they come out of their cylinder, it's not like a tripod just comes out. They have to build the tripod. They have like these little spider-like machines that can work on autopilot and start building this thing, which is crazy. And also it seems like it would make them super vulnerable because th they were dying in the book from artillery guns and the like. And it seems like you could shoot them while they're doing that if you could find where they crash landed or even shoot their cylinder while they're too hot. So in the movie, Tom Cruise goes into someone's basement who welcomes him in, which it felt like there was no reason why this random dude with a basement 
He's holding his shotgun. He's like, hey, over here. Like, why are you welcoming them in? Like, out of all the people who are running away, it just doesn't make sense. Seems like you would just hide there. And it also doesn't make sense that there wouldn't be more people who would have tried to hide in there. Anyway, all of that aside, it ties in similarly with something that happens in the book when the narrator is hiding with the curate, if that's how you say that. I don't know if it's curate or curate. Uh, he is basically a priest. The priest is like this little meat hook that he can't seem to shake and he's super annoying and he's just going crazy slowly during this book until he eventually dies. They're trapped in this house and the priest is basically trying to dig a hole out of there. And so does this crazy guy in the basement with Tom Cruise. The hole collapses for the priest, but not in the movie. But I appreciate that they were still trying to follow the book a little bit. And also when they go to board the ferry in the movie, that is very similar to in the book, but there was just way more anarchy in the movie. So in the movie, they're boarding the ferry and you know they, they had already gotten into some confrontations with people, but there's just mass amounts of people trying to board this ferry and then the aliens come over the hill and people start freaking out even more. Whereas in the book, the narrator goes and boards the ferry early and they stick around for hours letting people board, which in my mind when I was reading that book, I was like, I can't believe A, there are people still working and yes, they were charging a lot of money, kind of like that price gouging I was talking about. And then B, that they wouldn't just take off. You would think that you would just want safety, but whatever, they waited too long. And then of course the tripod show up and chase them into the water, which creates actually a really cool scene. And I, I like the book's uh, depiction of it a lot better. It's a lot more exciting. And they are able to kill some tripods in the process. There's a quote at the end of the book that I really liked. And it goes, surely if we have learned nothing else, this war has taught us pity, pity for those witless souls that suffer our dominion. I mean, that, that says it all because we were basically like ants to the Martians and we treat a lot of species that are inferior to us as such, similar to the way the Martians treated the humans. And if it wasn't for the germs that exist on Earth, Earth wouldn't be a thing in this book anymore. They would have gotten completely worked over. I found this part to be symbolic in the movie when Rachel gets a sliver because those aliens, when they ride in on the lightning, they do kind of look sliver shaped and she doesn't want to get it pulled. And she says, when my body is ready, it will push it out. And I feel like that was analogous to how Earth was going to be with these aliens because the germs, when they're ready, when they've infected the aliens, will push them out. Something I appreciate in the movie is that they started off the beginning of the movie the same way as the book starts. Like no one would have believed in the 21st century that you know, aliens were watching us and they say the same thing, but you know, different century in the book. Oh, by the way, if you've never read this book, the movie never really explains why the red weed grows, but in the book, they assume that the Martians accidentally brought it there. It basically being an invasive species that they weren't really intending, but probably stuck to one of their cylinders and then just grew like crazy here. When I was a kid watching War of the Worlds, I thought the red weed had something to do with how much blood they were taking from the humans. And I thought it was a direct representation of how the Martians were thriving. Something else that I thought was a little interesting and a sign of the times when the aliens are first invading in the movie and the family's driving away and the only working car in the area, Robbie says, is is this a terrorist? And I'm guessing they're saying that because it's about four years since 9-11. And though I know terrorism still exists today, it was way more potent back then for us to immediately jump to the conclusion of terrorism. When Ray is crashing at his ex-wife's house with his family, and then they hear that loud crashing early in the morning, that definitely seems like it is playing on something that happens in the book. In the movie, it's a plane, but in the book, a cylinder crashes right next to them and then they're trapped in this house for a couple of days because they're terrified of leaving. So in the book, the aliens do go and look for them and you know, there's some really suspenseful scenes in there where he's trying to cover himself up away from the alien that's investigating, similar to that of the movie. But in the movie with that little tentacle eye, and Tom Cruise is hacking at it. I really don't understand why the tentacle eye didn't pull back on the first cut, but waited until he hacked all the way through for the tentacle arm to pull back up. Just stupid movie things, you know? So in the book, a big weapon that the Martians have at their disposal 
is black smoke. And there's none of that in the movie, which is fine. I mean, they were already so destructive and terrifying. And I feel like that force field kind of balances it out a little bit. And something I didn't like about the movie, which I'm pretty sure is not at the end of the book, is Morgan Freeman's outro. He says, from the first moment the aliens arrived, breathed our air, ate and drank, I just don't like the fact that you're saying ate and drank. Like the point of them sucking that blood out is that's their fuel. So I feel like either call it eating or call it drinking or don't put the blood sucking in the movie, which they do have in there. I, it just seemed irritating. <laughs> and I've got to say, I don't often get to be the person who's that book snob, like, oh, the book was better than the movie. I thought the movie did a really good job, but... I am only just now starting to get into reading a lot of books, and so it's fun being able to see both sides of the same coin. Now, I will say this. I've never watched the older War of the Worlds movie, and I also have never watched the TV show. I probably never will watch the TV show. It just seems dumb. <laughs> just the, the images and the synopsis that I read from it. The old movie, I would be open to watching, though I would guarantee it's not as good as Spielberg's because Spielberg's really good. But I highly recommend you check out the book and the movie. It's fun if you read the book and then watch the movie as well. It's just, it's so much more interactive and you can kind of catch on to a little bit more things. But if you've already listened to this podcast, you'll probably catch on to those things no matter what. So anyways, that's all I have for you guys today on the War of the Worlds and War of the Worlds. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. If you want to see me do more of these book to movie discussions, please comment down below what books slash movies I should be covering. But I will let you know in advance, I probably will not read it because it is so damn long. And my wife has read it. And from what she has discussed about it, it sounds even crazier than the movie, which just seems frustrating. Thank you for listening to the podcast. And I'll see you in the next one.